Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassdoor video report for week 44, 2023. So we are really continuing this idea of this capital rotation, this capital waterfall, basically trying to use on-chain data to assess how capital moves through the system. And again, this is something that's common to all asset classes. We just happen to be able to see it on a much more granular level when looking at it through on-chain data because we have data from all of these blockchains coming in at block level and really assessing how money moves through the system. So we've covered this over the last couple of weeks. And what I want to do today is actually go down a bit of a relative performance rabbit hole. So we're going to start by looking at BTC and Ethereum. We're going to look at both of those two assets relative to gold, which is kind of the traditional store of value asset, to really show the, the magnitude of outperformance that we've seen this year against traditional assets. Now, what we're then going to do is we're going to dive in and look a bit more at the Ethereum side of the equation on the BTC and USD pairings, because we can start to see some very, very interesting dynamics. Many of you may have noticed that Bitcoin dominance via whatever metric you decide to, uh, to actually track that via. There's many ways we can look at Bitcoin dominance, but overall, it has been rising in 2023. Now, as someone who went through the 2019 and 2020 period, I do recall this as being a very, it is a typical thing that we see during this kind of bear market hangover phase where Bitcoin dominance tends to rise. Um, and generally speaking, the question is, uh, is the rest of the market outperforming the USD or is it essentially holding that level? So we're going to use Ethereum as kind of that second, uh, second asset in the space, looking at it on the USD basis, looking at it on the BTC basis. And what we find is some very, very interesting dynamics that we can really use to assess this capital rotation. And the last thing we're going to close out on, a couple of weeks back, we touched on, I think it was week 41, we touched on this alt season indicator, this concept of really trying to map all of these ideas into a single indicator. And what I really want to do is bring that back in, have another couple of conditions that we're iterating on, again, just to formulate these ideas on, on how you can really assess and look at uh, capital rotation throughout the digital asset space. So as always, please do give us a rate, a share, and a subscribe. It does help this channel get to more people. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure you drop them in the comment section below, and let's get stuck into the analysis. Okay, so here we are in our week on chain 44 dashboard, and we're going to start with a bit of a view on how Bitcoin and Ethereum have performed relative to gold. So this first chart is looking at in gold terms. So essentially gold is the denominator, no longer USD for Ethereum in blue and uh, Bitcoin in orange, essentially indexed to the 1st of January. So really this is the outperformance of Bitcoin and Ethereum relative to the gold price. Now we can see that Bitcoin got up to 90% plus in terms of relative performance. So it's had an extremely strong year. Um, it has almost essentially doubled its purchasing power in gold terms. Ethereum, on the other hand, has had a very strong year, got to about 40%. But as you can see, quite a significant and meaningful delta, which is also starting to expand. This is kind of that first indication. We're going to really step through this from a few levels. But this is kind of one of those many ways we can measure Bitcoin dominance as really growing. When we look at the actual relative gauging, uh, Bitcoin is outperforming gold to a significant extent. But um, And whilst Ethereum is having a good year versus traditional assets, it is not having a great year versus BTC. Now, what we've done here is take that same chart, but look at it on a rolling 30-day change. So essentially looking at what do the periods of growth or decline look like in these different assets. So again, we've got Bitcoin in orange, we've got Ethereum in blue, and in the white curve here, we have the gold price or the gold percent change. Now, what we can see is that during, let's just start with the downturns. When we actually get periods, because obviously markets don't move up or down in a straight line. So we get these periods of down, even though we've had, uh, had a fairly strong year. And we can see that Ethereum and Bitcoin are actually seeing very, very similar declines to the downside. So in terms of the actual downside moves, very, very similar in magnitude. But notice to the upside, Bitcoin is actually outperforming Ethereum pretty much every time we have a significant rally. So what we're really seeing is that Bitcoin is putting in more work to the upside and having essentially the same, it's kind of like a, a broader digital asset uh, downturn. So what we're really seeing is that Bitcoin is outperforming on the upside and roughly equal on the downside. Now, what we can also see is with gold oscillating through here, the amplitude of these moves is substantially smaller. Of course, this is often what gold is looked at for. It's that kind of longer term wealth preservation type asset. But you really can see that the outperformance of Bitcoin is quite stark. It is strong relative to Ethereum and Ethereum is relatively strong to Bitcoin, which means Bitcoin is doing substantially better than gold. So just another way to really visualize this. Um, and of course, 
in the current macro environment, this is going to be catching eyes of fund managers and investors and um, and people who are really looking at Bitcoin's performance, given the uncertainty of the world at the moment, potentially with a fresh set of eyes, which is uh, obviously exciting. Now, this is a chart that you've probably seen me cover for Bitcoin, uh, and uh, we've essentially mapped it onto the Ethereum side of the equation. You can see there's two of these. The first one is going to be on a USD basis, and the second one on a BTC basis. So basically just looking at what are we um, comparing this thing relative to, and let me talk through the logic of what's going on. So what we're looking at here, we've isolated only uptrends. We don't particularly care about the downtrend here. We're just looking at when the market is in a macro uptrend from whatever the local high is, how deep is the drawdown? So we're really looking at within an uptrend, how deep do the corrections get to in terms of a percentage uh, uh, pullback? Now the curves we've got here, just for simplicity's sake, are just the Fibonacci levels, a 10%, 23.6, all the way down to a 61.8, uh, purely because this is what a lot of technical analysts will look at, and it's just a nice reference point. So at the first observation in the USD basis for Ethereum, it has a very similar property to what we see for Bitcoin, which is that generally speaking, we get 61.8% for Bitcoin. Often we get above 50% corrections in all of our previous cycles. So these much, much deeper corrections are actually quite common. Now, with that as context, we've really only pulled back to the 38% level for Ethereum. So I mean, you can look at this from a few ways. Relative to previous cycles, we're actually performing quite well, meaning that versus the USD uh, as a baseline, Ethereum is actually performing quite well, certainly relative to its past history. Now, does that foreshadow that perhaps there's a deeper correction? Of course, we can never know. But what we can say is that given the duration of our current market, Ethereum is actually outperforming the USD substantially more than what it has in previous cycles. But now let's look at it from the BTC denomination. And why are we doing this? And again, why are we focusing on Ethereum here? Because being the second largest asset, it's often seen as a bit of a bellwether for the rest of the market. And as we've explored in previous episodes, this capital flow tends to go from Bitcoin down into Ethereum and then down into the longer tail of assets. Often, uh, we characterize that often by using stable coins because that's often the quote, uh, quote currency for a lot of these. So by looking at Ethereum in USD terms and then BTC terms, we can really see this dominance playing out. Now, what we see in the, in, the, uh, in the BTC denomination is a much clearer picture where we get this declining dominance in uh, for Ethereum, which means essentially Bitcoin dominance is growing. And then we generally get these long-term V-shaped reversals. Back here in the uh, 2016 cycle, this was about 300 days from when we had Bitcoin dominance uh, start to increase all the way down to its low during our 2019 cycle. So again, the low of the cycle had actually been put in on a USD basis at this point in time, but Bitcoin dominance increased for another 380 days. So 300 days back here in 2016, 380 days here in 2019 into 2020. That was that period I was referring to before. And we've seen the ETH BTC ratio performing quite poorly, actually. It's again, similar to the USD basis. It's holding up better than previous cycles but it has pulled back in a fairly consistent manner and we're at 470 days. So we have actually seen that the length or the duration of this Bitcoin dominance expansion is actually getting somewhat longer. So in that way, we're basically seeing that Bitcoin's dominance is taking more time and is you know, reaching kind of similar levels over time of uh, this kind of extended duration. So it, it really is this long period of Bitcoin growth during this Call, let's call it a bear market hangover phase. Uh, again, we're assuming that that's the kind of condition that we're in, but we've covered that over recent weeks. Um, and we can see that we've got down to the 38% retracement, or just over 40%. Um, in previous cycles, we have got down to 50%. So again, if we're looking at this on a relative strength, when this thing starts to reverse, if this thing does start to reverse, that's where we can really tell you know, what was the relative strength cycle after cycle, just by comparing these, uh, these different market conditions. So sticking with the Ethereum side, just to really understand a bit about where we sit in that kind of overall cycle. And um, in particular, you'll see us focus on MVRV and SOPA. We've performed, um, I looked at this over recent weeks for BTC. Um, and the reason why we look at MVRV and SOPA is that they're sibling metrics. One represents the unrealized profit and loss in the supply, MVRV, and one represents the spent or the realized side of the occasion, which is SOPA. 
So we had a paper that came out a little while back called uh, Mastering MVRV, which you'll find a uh, both a dashboard live on Studio um, for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and also the report will be in the description below. Now, what we in that particular model, we looked at these different pricing bands. So the green one is the realized price for Ethereum, um, often considered to be the average pri uh, acquisition price for all the coins. We have a 0.8 multiple of that, which is trying to pick up this kind of floor type behavior. You can see that we intersected and traded below it in 2019 and 2020 during this period of Bitcoin dominance. And you can see that we traded below it during the FTX saga, which is really where a lot of this kind of um, Bitcoin dominance started to expand. That was kind of the first instance. And then coming into uh, to, to later that year, that's when we really did have uh, a Bitcoin dominance being essentially continuing uh, upwards ever since. So on this particular basis, we're only hovering about 22%, where Ethereum is hovering 22% above its realized price, which is a fairly modest, uh, relatively small amount of unrealized profit. If we look at it from the MVRV perspective, here we've just plotted MVRV relative to 180 day moving average. You'll often see us do this here at Glassner. We like to use these kind of longer term moving averages, what we call a momentum signal. Because if you've got this long-term average and in the instance where we currently are, we get a slight breakout, it can indicate that you've got a bit of a trend shift. Overall, we're seeing the profitability of the ETH supply get to a point where investors may be in a better position. We're seeing this kind of general improvement as the market rallies, more and more people go back into the green and that generally is favorable for sentiment. It's pretty hard to be, uh, be excited about assets when your profitability is declining meaningfully relative to any kind of you know meaningful uh, average baseline. So we are in the process today of only just breaking above. And you can see we've actually got a trend bar down the bottom here. We've used Workbench to essentially just simply plot when we've got MVRV above or below its mo uh, moving average. And you can see it's a bit of a trend following tool. Now, why this particular trend following tool is quite powerful, and again, we cover this in Mastering MVRV, is particularly around cycle turning points. So when we get a large spike higher and then a crash in MVRV, which slices through that long-term moving average, this is telling you that a lot of traders are now trapped with a higher cost basis. We have a huge amount of unrealized profit. All of those coins get, uh, there's, there's people who bought in the previous bear selling coins to new investors at a high cost basis, which when the price drops, all of them suddenly fall into an unrealized loss. This is that shot across the bow moment where the bulls in the market, even though we did push to new all-time highs, and we've covered this over the course of uh, 2022, we had a much lower high in MVRV, and we'd already got that first signal that things weren't right by crashing below that moving average. So really, we're looking for these crossover points as a bit of a trend-following tool, and it comes down to that investor profitability. Is it improving or is it getting worse? Now, the exact same concept is totally applicable for looking at things like SOPA, which again is basically the spent version of MVRV. Of all of the coins that are held by the, by the investor cohort, the ones that are being spent, what is the profit and loss that they're locking in? And obviously these two can diverge. And we can see here with, we are still in negative territory, although attempting to break above that. Here we're using a 360 day moving average. Um, of course, as you're doing your own analysis, you can calibrate and change. Uh, we just like to use these kind of longer term ones to really illustrate the picture. But we are in the process of trying to break above, not quite there yet. So in many ways, the Ethereum market is in a bit of a decision point. Many investors are pretty much at their break even price or you know slightly in profit. We're seeing a little bit of profit coming back into the system, but it hasn't really developed any kind of meaningful trend. Quite often when we get a break above, it can tend to hold it for some time. But again, you're looking for these crossovers in either direction, just as that extra warning signal that maybe there's an inflection point in play. Um, so certainly one to be keeping an eye on in the weeks moving forward. Okay, so the last topic we're going to touch on, I think it was week 41, we built up this alt season indicator. And really, this is trying to describe how capital moves through the system. So just as a quick refresher, this here, we're looking at the 30 day change in the realized cap for Bitcoin and Ethereum, and the 30 day change in total stablecoin supply. Now, why do we do these? Well, the realized cap really represents the capital invested in these assets. If you buy a coin at 10,000 and you sell it at 40,000, somebody has to come in with that $30,000 difference. And that's going to result in a realized cap increase. 
Of course, the same is true in a bear market where you get capital outflows and you will get a negative 30-day change. That's like a capital outflow from the industry, that actual capital destruction. Stable coins typically boom towards the later stage of the cycle. They are the quote currency for DEXs and centralized exchanges. They really represent this kind of demand for a bit of speculative capital. So the capital moves into BTC first, tends to flow towards Ethereum second, and then you can see into stable coins, which is essentially a proxy for the, the long tail of assets um, following that. And we can see that this was even replicated during the second uh, Bitcoin all-time high. Bitcoin went first, Ethereum second, and um, stable coins, NFTs, and everything in between then fired off when the bear market was now well and truly in effect, right? So we were in the process of, uh, this is right before Terra Luna blew up. This was kind of peak alt season mania, and it got pretty dire shortly after. So this alt season index, uh, what we've seen is it's actually had a break above and we've actually had our signal fire off. Now, remember what this is looking at, the way this is constructed is when all three of these are seeing uptick. So let me actually just go back to this chart for one moment and I'll stick it on a one year view. And we can see that Bitcoin is leading in terms of capital inflows, which again, if you recall that previous price chart, we looked at on a year to date. Um, the 30 day rolling change, Bitcoin is seeing larger capital inflows on the realized cap than Ethereum. Stable coins have actually been net outflows until very recently. So all three of them are now in positive territory. We have Bitcoin, Ethereum and stable coins by this metric all increasing. And that is essentially printing our first flag. Now we actually have a second condition here. The previous one we looked at was actually a V2. The second condition we look at here is you can see this momentum oscillator. This is basically looking at the altcoin market cap. So everything excluding Bitcoin and excluding stable coins. And we're basically looking at when is it above its 30 day moving average. So it's just that kind of extra cross check that yes, we need to have capital inflows into the industry, but we also want to see positive price momentum within the altcoin sector. So really just adding that second you know, uh, second check to make sure that we really are picking up something that's meaningful. And again, what we're trying to do here is just demonstrate different tools, concepts, and ideas as to how we can monitor these capital flows. So just bringing it all back, we really started this episode by looking at relative performance to the traditional market, which we could see was actually quite strong. We then dove into the Ethereum side and what we noticed is that Ethereum is certainly outperforming gold, certainly outperforming the USD, but it's not quite outperforming Bitcoin. And this here is looking at our quarterly, monthly and weekly price performance of the ETH BTC ratio. And we can see that it has been negative in fact, since November, 2022. This is really when, uh, this is when uh, FTX blew up and we've seen predominantly negative performance and it's starting to actually accelerate in recent weeks. So it's telling us that, that Bitcoin dominance really is improving quite significantly. And this last chart, Essentially, what we're looking at is the total market cap of the space. So that's including everything. We've got our altcoin, um, uh, sorry, our, our total cap minus stable coins. We've got Bitcoin, we've got Ethereum, and we've got our total stable coin. So really looking at the different breakdown, but these two traces on the side is actually what I wanted to highlight just to really put this message home. The first one is that the, we've got the, this is the year to date performance. So measuring since uh, the 1st of January this year, Orange is the BTC market cap performance, which really, because we've got newly mined coins, in many ways, the market cap is a good way to actually track. If we're looking at year-to-date performance, it's probably a better way because there's new supply that's constantly coming online. So a $20,000 Bitcoin in uh, two years ago compared to a $20,000 Bitcoin today actually has a lot more demand to have soaked up those new coins that was mined during that period. And Bitcoin is now over 110% up. Uh, since the start of the year, which is quite remarkable performance. Um, and uh, again, something that's probably going to be catched in the eye of, uh, of fund managers everywhere. Now in the pink line down the bottom here, this is all altcoins, Ethereum included, minus stablecoins. So we're only looking at all digital assets, excluding stablecoins and excluding Bitcoin. Now, whilst it has still outperformed on a USD basis, it's only up 37.8%. So relative to Bitcoin's 110%, we're seeing a fairly significant divergence. So again, it's just really putting this concept of Bitcoin dominance during this hangover period. And if we actually just scroll back up and close on these charts, which I think are really a, a great way to visualize this, 
we typically see Bitcoin dominance improving throughout this period. And really it took up until March, 2020, where this started to reverse. And you can see that unlike the USD pair, which can get a bit volatile and move around quite a bit, a little bit harder to try and spot those inflection points, the inflection points on the BTC pairings tend to be a lot more, let's call it consistent. It tends to have these kind of rounded inflection points and then it starts moving in the other direction. So we are still well and truly in a period of Bitcoin dominance expansion. Um, and certainly what we've tried to cover here is just a, a different tool set to really look at how we can look at capital rotation within the space and when these events can potentially start to rotate and watching that capital moving throughout the system. So thanks everyone for tuning in for that session. Hopefully you found that useful. Um, please make sure if you have any questions or comments that you leave them in the section below. Um, we do go through all of those and we certainly appreciate your feedback. So I uh, look forward to seeing you the next week and I'll see you then. Cheers.